There's no way of sugarcoating it. Winston Churchill was a drunk. Or was he? I'm Indy Nidell, and this is a World War II special episode. Winston Churchill is different things to different people. To some, he is the greatest patriot Britons have, leading them through their darkest hour with the imperial majesty of a lion. To others, a hopeless reactionary, committed to a racist and aristocratic worldview from the 19th century. But something everyone can agree on when it comes to Churchill is that he loves to drink almost as much as he loves the British Empire. In fact, some people even say he is a high-functioning alcoholic. Winston himself enjoys this image, playing up to it when he can. But how much of a drunk is he? Well, you will find out in this special episode about the very special relationship between a prime minister and his drink. You've probably heard some of the famous drunk Winston stories. Perhaps the most infamous is the maybe apocryphal story that when a female MP tells Winston he is disgustingly drunk, he retorts, Yes, I am. And my dear, you are ugly. But tomorrow I shall be sober, and you will still be ugly. Now, stories like this are shrouded in a kind of he said, she said mystery. But you can't ignore the fact that there is a spirit-soaked trail of them running alongside his entire career. He really begins to develop a feel, a need for alcohol during his time in India. Though also an army officer, he joins the Malakand Field Force in India as a journalist in the 1890s. He finds the heat nearly unbearable, with water only being drinkable if cut with lime juice or whiskey. Guess which one Churchill chooses? It, it's whiskey. Before this point, he hadn't ever really enjoyed the spirit, but this experience ignites a lifelong relationship with it. Throughout his working life, Churchill will be seen nursing a whiskey and soda. Fast forward to 1931, and you can follow his actual life mostly until that on my old World War I channel. Today is just about the booze. Anyhow, he visits the States. Now, if you've been following our Between Two Wars series on the Time Ghost channel, then you'll know that America at this time is in the Prohibition era. This does not stop Winston Churchill, who smuggles in a healthy supply of scotch. In New York, he gets himself hit by a taxi cab. He is rushed to hospital, but only suffers from a few cuts and bruises. Nevertheless, he still manages to get his physician to secure him a prescription for more whiskey so that he can deal with any pain. And Churchill by no means limits himself to one spirit. His daily routine is to wake up early and go over administrative matters in bed. Alongside this, he will have an ample breakfast accompanied by a good bit of German white wine. The rest of the morning, he nurses his trademark whiskey and soda. And then at lunch, he gets really creative, like a wine and sherry blend is sometimes drunk before eating. If beef is on the menu, he'll usually have beer. If Stilton is present, he'll treat himself to some port. A bit of brandy never goes amiss after he's finished, and he also reportedly always has liqueur handy if he wants to spice up his coffee. But there is one tipple that he is really passionate about. He loves it more than whiskey. He loves it more than the colonies. He loves it more than cigars. It is that sparkling wine named after the idyllic region of France in which it is made. Champagne. His favorite is Paul Roger, which he has ordered by the literal caseload since the early 1900s. At dinner, it is reported that he drinks this by the bucket. Later in life, he will admit that he could not live without champagne, declaring that in victory it is deserved and in defeat it is needed. So this all sounds like Churchill spent most of his life in the bottle. And his boozy breakfasts, lunches, and dinners certainly are infamous with the amount he consumes in one sitting a point of wonder for any who witness it. But is he an out-of-control alcoholic? Well, it's actually more complicated than that. See, while he can certainly put it away, it is rare for anyone to see Winston off his tits. And when you look into it a bit more closely, you can see why. For one, his drinking sessions are usually alongside huge meals over long periods. The sumptuous food and frequent conversation no doubt dilutes the oceans of alcohol entering his system. And those bucket loads of champagne? Well, he actually only drinks a pint of the stuff during meals. That may seem like a lot, but considering his lunches take around two hours to finish, he levels his inebriation. As a matter of fact, in one of his frequent musings about his beloved beverage, Winston Churchill advises moderation in its consumption. In his account of the Malacan Field Force's campaign, he tells readers that, a single glass of champagne imparts a feeling of exhilaration. The nerves are braced, 
the imagination is agreeably stirred, the wits become more nimble. A bottle produces a contrary effect. Excess causes a comatose insensibility. So it is with war, and the quality of both is best discovered by sipping. And as for those regular scotch and sodas, well, in reality, they are a lot more soda than scotch. His private secretary will recall later in life that it was really a mouthwash. He used to get frightfully cross if it was too strong. Here's the thing, though. This moderation is by normal standards not moderate, right? So how does he do it? Well, it's safe to say that he's an alcoholic and a level drinker. Now, the body gets used to alcohol, so when you drink all the time, it will take much more booze to get you visibly drunk. Most of us pass out when we start approaching two promil blood alcohol levels. Level drinkers can have above four promil and still walk, talk, and act as if they were sober. So by any medical definition, Churchill indeed abuses alcohol, but he's not actually as much of an out of control drunk as you might think. In fact, Churchill himself writes in 1930 that I had been brought up and trained to have the utmost contempt for people who get drunk. So where does this image come from? Well, and Churchill kind of enjoys it, and he never misses an opportunity to play on it. He has a running joke with Frederick Lindemann, his chief scientific wartime advisor. If the two men are in a dining room, Churchill will explain, Prof, pray calculate the amount of wine, champagne, and spirits I have consumed in my life and indicate how high they would reach in this room. Lindemann will then get out his slide rule and respond that, unfortunately, it will be little more than a few inches. To which Churchill will reply, how much to do how little time remains. So the whole thing is clearly a bit of a joke to him. Even in his farewell address to frontline troops in 1916, he told the men that, whatever else they may say of me as a soldier, at least nobody can say I have ever failed to display a neat and proper appreciation of the virtues of alcohol. So, like in a lot of things, the legend is a bit more exciting than history. Nonetheless, there is no question that Winston Churchill consumes immense amounts of alcohol and likes to remind people that he does so every chance he gets. The reputation he has made for himself is already being seized upon by Nazi propagandists, though in 1940, their campaign against him is only just getting started. The Nazis are already portraying the British Prime Minister as a drunken fool. And despite it all, the whiskey-swilling aristocrat is still somehow managing to lead his country through the Blitz. But let's also not forget that, like his drinking is by 21st century standards an unhealthy addiction that breaks moral standards, so were many of his policies. For all of his achievements, and love him or hate him, Winston Churchill was an instrumental figure in a racist imperialist system that subjugated and at least accepted the death of millions of people to forward the interests of white British society. If you would like to find out how this drunken aristocrat became prime minister in the first place, you can take a look at this episode right here. We cover World War II week by week in real time as well, so be sure to subscribe and ring that bell to never miss an exciting episode each and every week till the war ends, and that could be two weeks from now, five years from now, a hundred years from now. You'll never know. See you next time. <laughs>